in a city that is uh, completely flat, uh, it actually becomes this sort of incredible expansion of the, of the urban landscape where the eight house crosses itself. Uh, we consolidated all of the amenities around this sort of uh, atrium uh, with a staircase that bounces between the walls connecting all of the amenities from the ground to uh, a shared uh, roof terrace. Um, and actually, it has really become a destination. There's no like a beautiful mountain that you can go and uh, you know, enjoy the view of your city. But now people can actually come here to stroll uh, and, and, and see the, the, the city from a different perspective. So it has really sort of extended the otherwise flat landscape of Copenhagen to become a new and more sort of uh, uh, exciting uh, three-dimensional public realm. So you can see like the, the main idea is really synergy that the, off the, sh the facades of the offices becomes the handrails of the path. The actual handrail becomes the street light. So each program and each, each part of the building sort of helps uh, and, and assists the, uh, uh, the other. As you can see, like a lot of these projects, uh, including the, the, the project we do here in Vancouver, is actually commissioned by a private developer. Uh, but because of the significance that each time you do something in the city, if it, if it was only the public buildings that contributed, you would end up having like a really boring city. And of course, like uh, the developer, like, like sometimes you mentally put it up that public and private interests are opposites. But of course, like Ian is interested in, in creating a successful neighborhood that makes you know a lively streetscape that makes you know uh, that puts customers in the shops and like uh, makes it uh, uh, easy to sell the, the the nice apartments. So in that sense, the, the the sort of the concern for the public realm and the community is actually like really all the way into the the private interest. But it, but in some um, in some cases we uh, we've actually been commissioned directly for public programs. We one of our first projects, actually our first building, was the Maritime Youth House that sort of extends the public realm over. Uh, a series of buildings creating this sort of informal playscape uh, on the waterfront of, uh, of Copenhagen. Uh, it also had the benefit that traditionally you're not allowed to build closer to the water than, uh, than 20 meters, but because the city saw the entire building, including the clubhouses, uh, but also the roofscapes as public space, we could actually scoot it all the way to the water's edge. Um, we did a competition to design the city hall of Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, that again is another beautiful UNESCO World Heritage uh, uh, medieval downtown. And the city wanted to take the existing 11 different departments that are spread throughout the, the, uh, the, the city and put it in a new building right outside the city wall. And we thought one interesting thing could, to do could be to undo the traditional dichotomy of having the public outside and the politicians inside to hover the town hall above a continuous public domain that extends the town square into what we call the public service marketplace, inviting people to sort of enter uh, the, the city hall at all times, see the politicians working. Um, we, um, <laughs> apparently they read. Um, so essentially we, we designed uh, uh, a building for each department, but made them overlap to create a continuous public institution. We call the public the, the public village. Um, and finally, in the background, you can see the spire of the existing city hall. And they really had imagined in the, in the master plan that they wanted a spire, because that, that's what city halls have in Europe. Uh, so we thought, let's put the city council inside the spire. They get an incredibly generous space. A sloping ceiling uh, uh, made out of mirror allows the politicians, when they have to make difficult decisions about the city they're messing with, all they have to do is look up. Uh, and they get this sort of periscope overview. Um, as a side effect, when the angry citizens gather to demonstrate, <laughs> They get this sort of perfect bird's eye view of the city council. They can see if politicians are absent or sleeping or <laughs> doing dirty deals or playing angry birds. Um, so we call it the, the democratic periscope that combines political overview with public insight. And, and to our great luck, the city council liked it and we are breaking ground in uh, uh, the spring. Um, but you know, in these cases, we really cater to the public. We, in one case, we actually took you know, public part participation to the extreme and in a way outsource the design to, uh, to the citizens. Uh, this is a photo taken outside our office in Copenhagen. Uh, some of you might remember that uh, Denmark had a cartoon crisis. 
uh, a provincial newspaper commissioned 10 cartoonists to show that in the, uh, in the sort of this crusade for liberty of speech, we can make fun about everybody, including the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, a, a billion Muslims disagreed here in, in Syria. Normally, uh, burning flags is uh, an honor reserved for stars and stripes, but this is also <laughs> now the Danish flag. Uh, this is like our, uh, our office in Copenhagen. This is a, a group of angry young Muslim boys living in the neighborhood, uh, sort of uh, venting their frustration. So uh, it, it became clear that Copenhagen is no, no longer like a homogenous culture. We are like part of a, a global diversity. This is a neighborhood. Uh, this is like right next to our office. This is our, our street where the office is. Uh, and this is the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. There are 60 different nationalities. And we did a competition to design an urban space uh, uh, in this area. And it was clear that integration and creating a sense of ownership would be a major part of creating a successful uh, urban space. So I'm, I'm going to explain one part of it, but essentially we, we uh, divided the, uh, the space into what we call the red square. Uh, and this is actually a, a photo uh, of the construction site, because uh, like, everything is like basically uh, nuances of red that indicates different uh, activities, uh, again, from the construction site. The sort of patchwork of red, the, the black market, where everything is black and the green park, where even the, the pavement is green. Uh, and within this like, simple idea of color, uh, we reached out to the local community. Instead of plastering it with Danish design, we asked people, we almost like tapped into the, sort of, the local global vernacular and asked people to nominate elements from their other home country. And the, the main idea is that you know, we don't eat Chinese food or Indian food to be nice to the Indians. Uh, it has nothing to do with political correctness. Uh, we're not specifying a Moroccan fountain to be nice to the Moroccans, but because the Moroccans have an incredible tradition for architectural water features, so now we're actually building this Moroccan fountain in Copenhagen. Um, we made uh, this sort of this mussel beach that combines elements from, uh, from Los Angeles, with, like Thailand, uh, China, this outrageous Estonian swing. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, we, we actually ran into a liability hurdle with this, uh, uh, with this swing. Um, there's like a, a slide from Ukraine. It's from Chernobyl, so we had to make a copy because the original is, is radioactive. Um, the sign on the red square is the sign from the red square. Uh, and even bollards from Ghana become incredibly exotic and beautiful when you put them in a sort of gray Scandinavian context. Uh, we have like, it's Denmark, so we need the bicycle parking. So we tapped into this sort of uh, safari of different kinds of bicycle parking. This one from Canada uh, actually has a bicycle pump integrated. It's like shameful that we didn't invent it. Um, and when you start looking at benches, it becomes like a social study. You have like a a Mexican and Spanish bench, and an S-curve that allows you to look the person you're sitting next to into the eyes. There's a built-in bench where everybody's looking away from each other. Um, so uh, it really re reveals these aspects. You have a, a, a sort of a play, a play octopus from, uh, from Japan, um, snow cannons from Sweden, bird cages from Holland. We found a palm tree in China that literally grows in the same climate as Copenhagen, it lives in snow. Uh, so now we have naturally occurring uh, uh, palm trees in, uh, in Copenhagen. And finally, one of the main reminders that you're in a foreign culture when you're traveling is actually the advertisement. And uh, we have li very little neon signs in Denmark. So as a series of very sculptural lamps, uh, we have these neon signs that advertise stuff you can't buy in Denmark. Uh, uh, my favorite is this, it's a neon sign of a dentist in Qatar. Uh, it's on the black market. And of course, on the red square, there's like assembly of relics from the co communist and Soviet countries. The Muscovit was the worst car ever produced. Um, so in many ways, you can say that uh, 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 like this, sort of, uh, the, this project in Copenhagen, rather than sort of perpetuating a petrified perception of Denmark as being uh, uh, sort of a monolithic culture, it really truly taps into and benefits from the true contemporary diversity of, uh, 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 of Copenhagen to, uh, today. 
So in a way, like all of these different ideas, we have tried to sort of put together in uh, like, you know, you say all of these different ideas like develop like as we go along over the last like uh, 11 years of practice, like we pursue various interests. Uh, and sometimes the, we get the opportunity to like almost like merge everything we do into a single, single project. It's uh, the largest project we're undertaking in, in, in Copenhagen right now, uh, uh, which is a project for a waste to energy power plant right in downtown Copenhagen. Essentially, uh, in Copenhagen, or in Denmark, we only landfill 4% of our waste. 42% gets recycled, and the remaining 54% uh, is used as uh, fuel to produce uh, electricity and heating. <clears throat> Three kilos of household trash turns into four hours of electricity and five hours of heating. Seen as a resource, a ton of trash equals almost the same as two barrels of oil. Um, and these waste to energy power plants are like all other power plants, big ugly boxes that cast shadows on the neighbors and block the views. Uh, but they have to be in the city to be like efficient in terms of uh, uh, delivering the energy and uh, assembling the, uh, the waste. This is going to be the tallest and biggest building in Copenhagen. It's right next to the Copenhagen Marina and right next to where the local boys go water skiing. Um, and we thought like, how can we make this building somehow contribute to the neighborhood, not just be like this black hole in the city fabric, but really a part of Copenhagen. Uh, and so speaking of skiing, Danes love to ski, uh, but we have absolutely no mountains. <clears throat> but we do have mountains of trash. Um, so we thought, uh, like, Copenhageners happily go five hours by bus to the south of Sweden to ski on this tiny little ski resort. Uh, but our uh, power plant is so big that we can actually put the ski resort, the same ski resort, on the roof of our building. Uh, we know how big the different machines are, so we wrap them in a sort of continuous envelope. Uh, and instead of making a visitor center where school teachers can drag the children to force them to listen to how, like, waste turns into energy, there's an elevator that takes you to a green, a blue, and a black ski slope. Um, miraculously, we won the competition based on this idea. Uh, <clears throat> So from 2016, you have to watch out for the Danes in alpine skiing competitions, because <laughs> now we can actually practice at home. Um, the facade of the building is, uh, uh, is made as this sort of uh, giant lattice of, uh, of planters that collects rainwater and filters the daylight into the naturally ventilated and naturally illuminated uh, workspace of the factory. Um, so in many ways, this sort of diagram or this idea of designing our cities as giant man-made ecosystems where we channel all of the flows of resources is very close to coming to completion in this project. It's like not only do we locally harvest the resources, the rainwater, the daylight, the airflow, but also together with the city, it really becomes a, an, a, an ecosystem. This is going to be the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Uh, the smoke coming out of the chimney is completely non-toxic but it still contains some CO2. So together with Realities United, the Berlin-based uh, uh, architecture and artist group, we uh, designed the mouth of the chimneys so they accumulate CO2. Uh, and when there's 100 kilos, uh, it puffs a gigantic uh, smoke ring. <clears throat> Uh, and of course, on, on one hand, we, uh, we think it's a, a pretty straightforward artistic uh, uh, em expression of hedonistic sustainability, that what used to be a problem, the chimney becomes something play playful that blows smoke rings. Um, but more importantly, one of the main drivers of behavioral change is knowledge, that if people don't know, they can't act. Uh, and like CO2 emissions is so abstract that you never really know what it is, like, and how much it is, and like, when it is. In 2016, all you have to do is count smoke rings. And when you counted 10 smoke rings, we just emitted one ton of CO2. Um, so <clears throat> also as you do, working with architecture and cities is almost like moving ideas around. And you can say like we stole the idea of the ski resort from, you know, from south, south of Sweden or Whistler and brought it to Copenhagen. Um, uh, shortly after, we got invited to do a, a competition for a ski resort in the north of Finland, in Lapland. And we designed this master plan where no surface in the entire complex has a slope of less than 7%. So you will never have to walk. You can always ski uh, everywhere. 
Um, and then the, the buildings are made in such a way that the people living in the penthouse uh, and everybody else can actually take an elevator to the top of the roof where you can ski uh, into the ski resort itself. So the hotel really becomes a man-made extension of the, of the skiing landscape. Uh, so we, uh, we won the job after sort of having moved the ski resort to Copenhagen and then back on top of the, the hotel in, in, in Finland. Um, as the last objection that I normally get when I show uh, uh, some of our work, uh, having moved to, to New York a year and a half ago, is that people say, yeah, 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 but this only works in like socialist, uh, sunny Scandinavia. Um, <clears throat> you know, like in Scandinavia, like it's so socialist that even the developers don't care about profits. <clears throat> it's not totally true. Um, but we, uh, we actually moved to, uh, uh, to, uh, to New York uh, and opened our office because we got invited by uh, the Durst organization to look at a house uh, or at a building site, a city block on the west side uh, of Manhattan. It's in a neighborhood called Hell's Kitchen. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the building is sandwiched between a power plant on one side and a waste management facility on the other side. They're not combined, but we're sandwiched in between. And then there's the west side highway. So even though it's a beautiful site on the waterfront of the, uh, of the city, it's also quite far away from the sort of uh, uh, central park. So we actually thought that to the right is the building where my dad grew up and where my grandparents lived. It's a typical Copenhagen courtyard. And in many ways, the Copenhagen courtyard is at the architectural scale what Central Park is at the urban scale, like an urban oasis in the middle of the dense city. So we thought, like, what happens when you combine the American skyscraper uh, with the Copenhagen courtyard? Or essentially, what would a court scraper look like? Um, so basically, we placed the courtyard next to the Helena, the tower. Uh, it's not only owned by our client, but it's also named after his daughter. Uh, so we preserve all of the Helena's views. Uh, and then to, to provide the Manhattan density, we lift up the northeast corner to 460 feet, uh, still maintaining uh, sunlight from the south and the west, and preserving all of the views of the, of the river. Uh, so it becomes this sort of striking new silhouette uh, uh, on the Manhattan skyline, this sort of... Uh, like Kumin Courtyard, twisted out of proportions to almost become a, uh, a tower. The courtyard that is normally a secret kept for the tenants or for Google Earth actually becomes a major part of the, of the public perception uh, of the building. From the east, it turns into the spire. Uh, and like the residents living facing the, the, the twisted roof, they actually have like terraces sunken into the, to the roof plane. Uh, and because of the insane asymmetry of going from 42 inches to 400 feet, uh, everybody actually has views of the, of the river and, uh, and New Jersey uh, and the sunset, including uh, uh, the park itself. So, um, so to, to wrap it up, uh, I think I really believe that, uh, that architect life in the city evolves and how these structures evolve. You actually have the capacity to almost like observe and listen and learn how things are evolving, evolving and where they're going and almost draw an outline that makes things invisible or like makes things visible that have previously been sort of uh, unavailable to the human eye. And in many ways, New York over the last 10 years, you can say the skyline of Manhattan is really the child of, of commerce and industry and finance. But over the last 10 years, the uh, industrial waterfront has turned into the Hudson River Park uh, the, the most popular uh, park in the city, the High Line, is a former train line. They have like, made more bicycle lanes in New York than we have in Copenhagen. Granted, the city is also a little bit bigger. Um, they've, they've pedestrianized uh, uh, um, Broadway and major parts of, uh, of Times Square. And, uh, and they have this plan, plan of planting a million trees, and they reach like 700,000 and something. So in many ways, the... Uh, the project on, uh, uh, on West 57th Street, the court scraper, really makes visible this idea of the rejuvenation of the city, making it a more livable uh, uh, place to be, and takes this idea and really brings it into the city fabric itself by sort of invading and bringing the oasis into the city block uh, uh, in itself. So we actually scheduled to, uh, to break ground in, uh, in May. So if you come to New York in... Uh, in, uh, in four years, uh, here's a, a very short film of what it might be like uh, driving up and down the West Side Highway. Yeah, 
now I'm back Brooklyn, now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the Narrow, but I'll be hood forever, I'm the new Sinatra, and since I made it here, I can make it anywhere, yeah they love me everywhere, I used to cop in Harlem, all of my Dominicanos right there up on Broadway, pulled me back to that McDonald's, took it to my stash spot, 560 State Street, catch me in the kitchen like a Simmons whipping pastry, statue of liberty, long live the world trade, long live the king, yo, I'm from the Empire State. 